Today, I am very honored to be talking to Dr. Dr. Andre Van Mol, and he is a family physician, but he has gotten really involved in some of the issues involving the medical transitioning of children. And I got interested in you after I saw sort of an analysis you did about the Brandstrom study, which initially um, sort of claimed to show that these uh, cross-sex surgeries improved the mental health outcomes of people with gender dysphoria. But you and some of your colleagues debunked that. So I was wondering if you could just initially talk about the Branson study, what it initially claimed, and then how you discovered that those claims were spurious. I'll be glad to. Thank you for having me on the show, Erin. Uh, the American Journal of Psychiatry, uh, October 2019, published a study by Branstrom and Pachankis, uh, it claimed to be the first of its kind, a total population study of Sweden, so you know, 9.7 million subjects there, in which they looked at what they called gender incongruence, so what we call gender dysphoria, or maybe more aptly termed uh, gender anxiety. And they wanted to know what the effect was on three different uh, outcomes of mental health for people that had gender-affirming hormone therapy um, and uh, gender-affirming surgery, which we're probably more used to calling a sex reassignment surgery. Now they said right in the study from the outset, gender affirming hormones achieve no improvement, but they claimed that the sex reassignment surgery, again, what they're calling gender affirming surgery, did help the stats. Well, our team found a lot of problems with this study and our team, by the way, was endocrinologist, uh, Dr. Michael Laidlaw, uh, child and adolescent psychiatrist, Miriam Grossman, and Professor Paul McHugh of Johns Hopkins, and, and yes, I mean that Paul McHugh. Um, so, you know, we looked at it, there's all kinds of problems here. So we decided to write a letter to the editor. Now, you're only allowed 500 words with that, including your citation, so you really have to tailor it down. Uh, but we, you know, we submitted it within a month of the publication of the article, as kind of tends to be the benchmark. Uh, Mind you, this was last fall. We were told around early summer, hey, it's been accepted for publication, and that publication date ended up being August 1st. Uh, now you kind of wonder, gee, how does it take 10 months to publish a letter to the editor? So we knew something was up. So the August 1st electronic edition of American Journal of Psychiatry published our letter and six others, much like it. So seven critical letters to the editor, plus a major correction paragraph from the editors of AJP uh, saying we were concerned enough with the contents of these letters that you know, they actually went out and uh, hired statistical consultants to look over the findings, which that doesn't happen every day. Kind of wish it did, you know, judging from the quality of some of these kind of studies that get published, but they did it. And the consultants uh, presented their information to AJP as well as the original study authors. And they said, you know, we largely agree with the critics here. We would ask you to reanalyze your statistics and this time do an actual comparison between gender incongruent people who had and who didn't have the uh, gender affirming surgery. They did that and their findings were also published. So the third thing in this AJP edition in which they said, yeah, you know, on, on reanalysis, our conclusion was too strong, which is way putting it mildly. Um, they generated one table in their letter to the editor, or excuse me, their letter responding to the letters to the editor, uh, showing you know, uh, gender incongruent people with gender, gender affirming uh, surgery and in gender incongruent people who did not uh, get gender affirming surgery. And every one of their three endpoints was worse for people who had the surgery than for those who didn't. Now, not all of it was statistically significant, but it was all significant, if you're seeing what I'm saying. So now we have this study that claims to be, you know, the first of its kind, total population study, that even the authors admit shows that, again, for their three endpoints, both gender-affirming hormones and gender-affirming surgery achieve no improvement. Therefore, the study in our mind's eye is invalidated. And again, we found a lot of problems with the study. Well, and that, that is um, concerning because one of the, the claims of people who are pushing these medical interventions are that they will improve mental health outcomes. And um, I can't, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this right, but there was the DAJ, I think is the, 
from Sweden. The 2011 study from Sweden, yeah. Right, that showed that actually people who medically transitioned had like a 19.5 higher suicide rate, which is, that's significant. Um, and then this well, yeah, study coming out. Yeah, we brought up that study in our letter, you know, committed a paragraph to it saying, look, we, we you know, personally we view this as one of the best of its kind, if not the best of its kind, because the, the study you're speaking of, the 2011 study, was prospective, not a retrospective study like Branstrom. So they followed along, you know, 30 years of records um, for everyone that had had sex reassignment surgery, as they called it, uh, in Sweden during that time frame, 324. So, you know, selection bias of zero, they included everybody. And they found if you follow out past 10 years, not the attempted suicide rate, but the completed suicide rate was, as you said, 19 times out of the general population. Also, three times the all-cause mortality, meaning you know, everything that can kill somebody, three times higher for them, and almost three times the psychiatric hospitalization rate, which doesn't sound like an improvement by any means. Plus, in that study, particularly useful test, they included all the different registries the Swedish government keeps, which made it possible to analyze these statistics. In the Brandstrom study, you know, the only three endpoints they looked at, by the way, uh, were hospitalizations after a suicide attempt and prescription, uh, prescription use for anti-anxiety and antidepressant meds. And the third thing was um, hospital or clinic visits for anxiety or depression. Those were the three endpoints. And they said, oh, we didn't look at this, we didn't look at that, we couldn't look at this, we couldn't look at that. When we knew for a fact from the 2011 study, all these registries exist. So exactly why couldn't you assess these things? They did in 2011, the least you could have done, or I should say a very good thing you could have done, which we also put in a letter, would be to give us a follow-up of that study. You had the means at your disposal, why didn't you do it? Uh, and, th and this was one of the great shortcomings of the study. And again, we found a bunch of them, but they only looked at those three outcomes. Well, you know, pick the one of them, hospitalization after suicide attempt. The really obvious question is, why didn't you look at completed suicide? You, you have a registry for that. And that's kind of a big item. Why didn't you look at absolutely every other thing a person would be hospitalized for medically or psychiatrically that could also be very directly related to the gender dysphoria and what you did about it. If you, you know, went the path of gender affirming hormones, gender reassignment, sex reassignment surgery, we'd call it the gender affirmation surgery. You didn't look at any of that. This was really selective. You shouldn't have done that. You know, the um, fact that, that they didn't look at completed suicide to me is just really suspect. I mean, that's, that's such an indicator of mental health outcomes. And if you're going to claim that these help prevent suicide, and then you don't even look at com completed suicides, I'm confused as to how they can make that claim at all. We called it a glaring omission. Yeah. It really stands out, like you said. And then the other thing that, that, that you sort of indicated is that this was a fairly short-term study. And the, the earlier Swedish study showed that after 10 years is when you really started to see some pro significant concerns with uh, people using these interventions. And if, if I understand correctly, this study only looked at three years. Is that correct? Not even. Not the even. requirement for the study, you know, when you, you look in those parts of it, was to be alive December 31st, 2014, and to have gender incongruence. And the study only covered calendar year 2050, January 1st to December 31st. And yet, you know, you look at part of the study, this figure one, which uh, was time since last gender affirming surgery, and it goes out 10 years. This study was entirely retrospective. You read that particular table, I could see how someone would easily think, oh, well, here's a prospective element where they followed people for 10 years. They didn't. They asked them to recollect back and, you know, kind of printed it out as 10 years. So potentially misleading. Um, you know, besides the retrospective design, you know, not longitudinal, the lack of an initial control group, that only came when they were asked to reassess their data. Uh, there's this strong implication of loss to follow-up. Now, the study said, look, we um, had 2,679, so let's say under 2,700 individuals uh, who were gender incongruent. Now, compared to a lot of studies, that is really a high number because there's plenty of them out there looking at outcomes with 50 and 80 people. So 2,700 is a lot, but keep in mind, this was a total population study 
that's a full order of magnitude below the prevalence statistics we would expect if we we're using, for example, the DSM-5. So where'd they go? You know, 90% of the people who should be there are gone. What's up with that? Uh, the three measures problem, again, as we you know, talked about, they were just looking at uh, prescriptions for anti-anxiety and antidepressants, visits for those same three problems, and hospitalizations after attempted suicide. But again, you're not looking at completed suicide. You're not looking at prescriptions of other medications that would commonly be used for those two problems. You're not looking at hospitalization, psychiatric or medical, for all the other things that can be going on in someone's life directly related to their gender incongruence and any uh, transition type therapy that they attempted. Uh, there were too few surgeries, you know, other charts and graphs of theirs. Uh, you know, very low, the amount of people who had any kind of surgery, let alone those who had actual genital surgery. And in Sweden, all that stuff's free. There's not a whole lot of reason not to do it if you were inclined to. Um, where did those people go? So lots to follow up, lots to follow up, lots to follow up. And this might just be a really crummy study if it hadn't had such a huge impact but it, it had a huge impact. So when it was first released, I remember on the media, um, you know, Good Morning America and the Today Show and all of these, you know, major media outlets were touting it as this amazing study to prove that these interventions helped save lives. Um, unfortunately, we're not seeing that kind of publicity on upon the or the correction. Um, we're seeing some, we're starting to see some, but it tends to be just focused on by the, you know, sort of the, the right wing media, I think. So, so how, do, how do we, you know, how do we get people to understand the significance of this study? And are, especially when people are still using it to justify these medical interventions. Right. Um, I guess the overarching thing here is, is this is a nice case study. Um, for your viewers in terms of how this whole field works. Um, in fact, you know, all of peer review, um, science peer review journals is really kind of in a crisis. I mean, there's all kinds of articles out there about this in the peer review literature about, wow, you know, a lot of bad stuff's going on. And often peer review, you know, is ideological trench makes, making sure, making sure the wrong people don't get into the country club, if you know what I mean. So it's, it's exclusionary, not for the right reasons. It's anything but the open market of free and justifiable ideas. But down to the point here. <clears throat> I was alerted of this study. Uh, I, I was sent it you know, by some constitutional attorneys on a given weekend when and I happened to be in Washington uh, you know, speaking at a conference. Um, by that Monday, that's when we, you know, it was all over the media, as you're saying, you know, that may, it maybe wasn't every outlet, but there were plenty of them. So here's how it works. Um, their side of the picture, which, you know, everything having to do with the acronym juggernaut, they control the media, you know, their allies are in the media, it's in academics, this has been going on for decades. So we're painted into a corner and we're fighting a fight that took decades to get us into this place. So the study comes out and the news outlets are alerted. Here's the study by whatever the organizations are that are doing it. Here's the conclusions you should have. Here are your talking points. Because you notice how uniform the talking points look. Well, that's not necessarily dirty. That's good tactics. So as I was telling you know, people in our group, as well as some of the broader task forces I, I work with, why aren't we doing the same thing? Because within 24 hours of what we're talking about, the August 1st edition that had our letters to the editor, the correction, which that correction was functionally a retraction of the one positive finding of the study, right? Uh, as well as the authors coming in saying, oh, you know, our conclusion was too strong. Well, that, yeah, yes, that's putting it mildly. Yes, it was too strong. In fact, it was wrong, right? 24 hours out, uh, I found, you know, maybe two stories on it. And, and as you're saying, it tended to be the conservative media, be that of faith or, you know, secular. I was, you know, so I was telling the group, we need to do this too. It's really not that hard. So several of us um, fed it to different news outlet sources. And then by the end of the week, you know, I find myself doing some, some TV stuff you know, radio uh, interviews with the media that have continued till now. And you know, what are we like six weeks out from the thing? So it's been kind of picking up steam. 
No, it's not NBC, it's not CNN, it's, it's not, you know, New York Times. But even now, it's like, you know, picking up momentum. You can't fight every fight, you know, you can't win every battle, you, you must strategize and apply your time, otherwise you're, you're watered out to nothing. So the task forces that I work with, we have largely decided that we put our, um, our maximum efforts into affecting the peer review literature. That's not the world's fastest process, but already in the two years that we've set to do this, we have eight different commentaries and letters to the editor in peer review literature. And that's just us, let alone other teams trying it. So you, you try to affect academics, peer review literature. You try to affect legislation, so helping you know, different state or even federal legislators, uh, both drafting appropriate laws as well as opposing inappropriate laws. And, and thirdly, working with the courts, because of course that's where you know, things get duped out. So you know, writing amicus briefs and even providing testimonies to circuit court and Supreme Court level stuff. Um, that, you know, there's, there's so many things happening just that, you know, the local court level, and those are serious, and it's people's lives being ruined, you know, and you want to be able to help all of them, but, but for us, we, that would dilute us to nothing. Uh, plus, as has been the experience of several of us uh, in these task forces, we've done that, you know, provided um, testimony, affidavits, whatever, to courts, only to find that they're immediately sealed. So all of your effort is for nothing, you know? Oh. So we try to affect the big things, because again, you win the right circuit court or Supreme Court cases, you've taken care of a thousand smaller things. So forgive me for that little tangent, but um, so we're, we're not gonna be everyday faces, you know, to you. And every one of us have lives of our own, you know, we have- No, our, our, our actual really? jobs. Yeah, I mean, I'm a family <laughs> physician all day, that's what I do. Right. I have my own family, you know, my wife and my kids. Uh, needless to say, like anybody, we have our other involvements and you know, boards or, or things that we feel strongly about that we love working, you know, with. And in my case, you know, things related to culture of life, um, you know, human and family flourishing, you know, those kind of things. Um, so all this other stuff is, you know, we're not paid to do this. Uh, we don't have these, you know, massive organizations behind us like the other side does growing money like it's candy. But that's often the way it is, not just with this, but historically too, you know, fighting against great wrongs. Uh, it's really often a David and Goliath type scenario. You know, so the question is, what are you going to prioritize? What's going to be your frame of mind, heart, and spirit to really be able to persevere, you know, in this stuff and not get all, um, you know, exhausted doing, doing things you shouldn't be doing. Well, I'm so grateful that, that you and your colleagues um, put your time into this. And it's an interesting um, combination of people. When you mentioned Paul McHugh, he's, he's just world renowned for his, yeah. um, for his research and the fact that he's, he's um, actively trying to bring some sanity to this issue is, is encouraging. One of the questions that I do have is that this study is flawed, as you talked about. It's a very flawed study. And yet with its flaws, it's, it's, it's showing that cross-sex hormones and surgeries do not improve mental health outcomes. Right. As, as flawed as it is, do you feel like those results are valid? And maybe even more valid because of the flaws? Exactly. Um Several, you know, again, there was seven different groups writing letters to the editor. Um, several amongst us are petitioning AJP to change the title of the article. It's not enough that someone has to read all the way through it in the end and see this other stuff. Um, but don't retract it. Um, you know, you think, oh, you want to retract that thing, you know, really wrestle them to the ground. No, because as an existing study that, again, it claims all this stuff about itself. Gee, it's the first to do all these things. So now we have positive findings of negative results. That needs to stay in publication. Um, and, and you were mentioning also um, earlier, and I meant to hit up on it, about how people are being pressured. You know, it's what they call gender affirming therapy, which I, I would like your viewers to think of as transition affirming, because that's what this is about. You know, this linguistic thing, we see ground on that too easily and now we're paying for it. You know, because you think there's nothing you can do about it. 
that language affects thoughts, thoughts affect belief, and beliefs affect culture. And, you know, the other side, uh, you know, all things secular progressive, they are so good at weaponizing language, and we need to get better at you know, contesting things. Well, and that's so interesting that you bring that up because I actually testified at the Utah State Legislature about what they're calling the conversion therapy ban because they're right. trying to ban the very therapy that helped me when I was a kid. And when I s started reading the comments on news articles, first of all, the news reported that, you know, there was, you know, one hate group that testified mm -hmm. against the legislation. And at the that time I had, <laughs> that was, yeah. at the time I was completely not affiliated with any organization um, whatsoever. But then when I read through the comments and, you know, in the newspapers and, and various news outlets, people said things like, of course we want to ban this. How can we justify electrocuting people? Or we don't want to give people lobotomies or how can you support these, you know, beating people for their sexual orientation. Yeah. And it just, it really reinforced that, that they had controlled the, the language and the, the dialogue narrative. on this. The and they narrative. genuinely believe it. It's not like they're lying. No. And, and of yeah. course, like if I were someone and I read that, of course I would support this ban because I don't want anybody to get a lobotomy, you know? Right. But. What mirrors the lobotomy craze is this transition affirming therapy for minors. And that's what's mm -hmm. ironic is it's almost like we are, we are, they're, they're, they're encouraging this um, treatment that is as heinous as these other treatments that they say they're against. Yeah. And, you know, like you were saying, parents and, you know, therapists and, and doctors all uh, are, are being browbeaten, in, in fact, bullied, you know, that, hey, you either support transition or it's suicide. And the classic line parents are hearing in counseling is, look, do you want a live son or a dead daughter? It's false advertising. It can't deliver on that. I mean, we can quote all kinds of professors of psychology, sociology, whatnot, that are very, you know, pro-gay, who are the first to say there's no evidence long-term that, you know, gender-affirming therapy uh, improves mental health, and particularly not that it reduces suicides. You know, plus the idea uh, that, uh, you know, suicide is induced by, by not allowing therapy, the studies aren't good. You know, the best studies show the worst results, like this 2011 Sweden study. So people have been sold a bill of goods on something that's a bill of goods in the first place. Kind of my one liner on this for people is, you know, particularly with regards to children, what are the ethics of permanently medicalizing a condition in a child? that overwhelmingly desists, overwhelmingly goes away by adulthood and doing it on the basis of a self-diagnosis. This is not how medicine works. It's not how surgery works. You're talking about consent. You know, kids have developing brains that, you know, prefrontal cortex, the whole judgment and inhibition center, you know, it takes a quarter century for that fully to develop. That's why we protect kids. We don't let them drive till they're 16. And for most countries in the world, I guess it's 18. Lots of other things they can't do until they're 18, you know, contract law and stuff. Uh, and of course, in the case of alcohol, because of track record, we don't let them do it till they're 21. And yet on this, something so, uh, you know, monumental, so uh, outcome inducing for, for a minor for the rest of their life, uh, you're letting them make this decision as a kid. It's ridiculous. Plus, you know, if you just look at the prevalent statistics of the DSM-5 for what they call natal females, women, the, the prevalence of gender dysphoria should be less than three thousandths of one percent. For natal males, less than fifteen thousandths of one percent. It should be infinitesimal. And yet we have three different surveys from last year, one out of uh, Minnesota, California, and a national one, in a real, you know, youth, where 2% of them say, yeah, I can be trans. And now I'm seeing that in studies as though it were, oh, and you know, 2% of American youth can, you know, are or identify as trans. No, that is, that is social contagion and semantic contagion. Kids are having this thrown at them from every angle. Uh, it, it's difficult, you know, unless you really look at it, uh, it's difficult for parents to understand how much is going against your kid. It's the social media, it's the entertainment media, it's the school districts because they're, you know, the teachers are taught to taught this or else, or to teach this or else. Could be welcoming from your pediatrician, you know, or what, uh, depending on, you know, how woke and vogue they are. Um, and it's completely one side of the story. So as Dr. Lisa Littman, you know, Brown University said in her kind of groundbreaking 
uh, study surveying parents of kids with that rapid onset gender dysphoria uh, and their commonalities, which of course she's pilloried for, you know, it's two, it's two years old now. Um, and she found in, in, in looking at it that really for the kids, um, transgenderism is the catch-all diagnosis to explain all their harms, their wounds, their psychological, their trauma, and transition is the cure-all diagnosis. So transgender is the catch-all, transition is the cure-all, and it, it's, it's not, you know, it's, it's, a, it's fad medicine, and fad medicine is uniformly bad medicine. Uh, I'm so, trying to think yeah. of a case where, um, another case where people would celebrate the, the mass sterilization of children the way that right. we are now, and, 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 and medicalization. So not only are these kids, um, their fertility is, is seriously threatened, yeah. but they are becoming medicalized, as you said. So if a child, to my understanding, if a child goes on puberty blockers and then cross-sex hormones, their ability, their, their um, hormone secreting gonads atrophy, and after not too long, they will be unable to, to produce those hormones if they decide to desist. So it's more definitive than atrophy, you know, if you go with it blocking at tanner stage two, so before puberty really hits, it's actually puberty blocking, as is recommended by the Endocrine Society guidelines and WPAP and those guys, the sperm and egg haven't fully matured. So you're, you're blocking that in stasis. You stay on those puberty blockers a full five years, there's no guarantee that, well, let's put it another way, there's a pretty strong probability that you're now sterile. But you follow that with cross-sex hormones, now you've guaranteed it. Let alone, you know, if you engage, engage in a sex reassignment surgery, gender affirmation surgery, where you actually remove the organs, you're that way for sure. And in Sacramento, you know, because of another bill we're fighting here, I submitted written testimony, uh, other of my colleagues, you know, doing it in person. And I kid you not, the legislators we're accusing us of scaremongering and of just not knowing the facts because this stuff's fully reversible. Well, so at great effort, some other teammates, especially uh, endocrinologist Mike Laidlaw and some attorneys, took them two years, but they finally got it just this spring, the consent forms from Children's Hospital Los Angeles regarding that $5.7 million NIH study, the first of its kind, to look at the medical effects of puberty blocking, only the second to look at the psychological effects. And let me stop there for a second. First of its kind to look at the effects of puberty blocks. So we're doing all these interventions and we have no research to so support it. It's entirely it. experimental. You can't say this is the standard of care. You can't, it's just not true, right? Uh, I and others uh, looked up UC San Francisco transgender care webpage. Anybody can do that. It doesn't take lawyers, you know, like it took our team to get the stuff from Children's Hospital LA. And it says right on there under, you know, preparing kids for, you know, uh, puberty blocking, um, that you need to have a frank talk about fertility. And yes, it's highly likely that, you know, taking puberty blockers before the sperm and egg develop means they won't, particularly if you're on it long enough. And then there, there was this galling statement and, you know, something to the effect of, and I'm paraphrasing tightly, this is actually more of a concern usually for parents and family than it is for the children who want well, uh, the assignment. Well, of course it would be because the kids don't get what go is going on. You know, they can't project out that far. That's actually how um, it, two of us, uh, myself and Mike Laidlaw, talked one of our very lefty legislators, who's a member of the Gay and Lesbian Task Force, out of supporting a certain bill in 2018. Uh, she and her chief of staff understood exactly what we were talking about. Um, and so she ended up abstaining on all three votes. And you think, well, an abstention's not a no. It's like, look, there's eight people on the gay and lesbian, um, you know, they don't call it task force, sorry, the gay and lesbian coalition in the California legislature. They know how each other vote. So I'm sure she paid a price for her abstention, but, you know, we congratulate her for doing it. But the point is, the legislators, they didn't know. I mean, it, again, it's... Well, and, and, and my understanding is that initially the, the IRB approval for that study allowed them to start uh, cross-sex hormones at, I believe it was 13. And I saw a revision that now kids as young as eight years old are being... It was puberty blocking at 12. Right. And cross-sex hormones as young as eight years old. That's and it. that, you, and that yeah, there Mike are Laidlaw girls... Got that. 
and their girls having double mastectomies at the age of 13. And this is happening in the US now. And like you said, when I tell people this, they say I'm making it up. They do not believe me. And yet it's right there in the in in the grant for the NHS. So and National Institutes of Health grant. We're paying yeah. for this study as, as taxpayers. I can't figure out how they got IRB approval for it other than they're sort of doing it, like you said, as a, I think as a, we're, we're giving these treatments. Oh, and then we're going to follow up on it. But yeah. they're having that dropout rate. Um, it's phenomenal. Yeah. Well, which Johanna which, Olson Kennedy, you know, basically is heading up the study. She's a pediatrician at Children's Hospital LA. And, you know, a couple of years ago, she she published a study like the one you just referred to, where she's talking really openly about girls as young as 13 getting top surgeries, you know, mastectomies, and, uh, you know, uh, boys as young as 17 getting the whole job done. So that's hugely problematic. And again, our endocrinologist on our team here, Mike Laidlaw, um, he had the opportunity to present this to some physician members of Congress. And when he told them the puberty blocking and all this was approved down to 12 for the study, they were beside themselves. And then he stops and he goes, oh, no, no, I got this. I succeeded in getting this other document. Uh, they have permission. They moved it down to eight. They, they, they went nuts. So, so you mentioned consent just a little bit. How do you go about writing a consent form for something that's purely experimental when we have no longitudinal studies about what the outcomes are going to be for these kids? Well, we surmise they didn't let go the consent to our team for very good reason, right? And, and again, by releasing it this spring, that the five-year study was over in December. We're waiting for their analysis to be published. I should say we are ready and waiting for their analysis to be published. So they released it to us. Some of our people released it to the right people in Congress. Um, who immediately called the NIH on the floor, you know, nice letter explaining, we want answers to this, this, this by July 31. We have the NIH's answer to them, which, like these consent forms, was inadequate. For all that they admitted to in there, which is handy to know, because now you can't tell us you didn't know, you know, um, there were other inadequacies in there. And even if the thing were perfect, the letter of the law, kids don't get it. You know, there's the kids version of these things and there's the adults. How can they understand? Kids don't get the idea of it's permanent. I can't take it back. And again, that same Johanna Olson Kennedy, the pediatrician at Children's Hospital LA, in, you know, another publication of hers, or in an interview with her rather, maybe, um, she said, you know, if they change their minds and they want breasts, they can get them later. Honest and yeah. for true. You know, yeah. no, you can't get. And she said it with later. such a cavalier manner that it made yeah. me wonder if she knew what a breast was. I mean, <laughs> yeah. you can't just go get a new breast. It doesn't no. work that way. And the fact that that a doctor who's advocating these treatments has that attitude is incredibly concerning. Very much. That's what we think too. So, you know, again, we're uh, different people on these teams. Um, we're waiting to act. Once anything's published about that study. You know, as, as you were commenting also earlier, something Johanna Olson Kennedy had published before said she had a 40% dropout rate. Well, that's it. I mean, you know, some of our team that are epidemiologists who have worked on this kind of stuff say, wow, you know, once you've lost 20% to follow up on a drug study, you're done. You know, if that were happening, you know, with an actual like a new pharmaceutical, they would be knocking on doors trying to retrieve patients because it calls everything into question. 40% means you got junk. One of the questions these congressmen asked of the NIH is how many kids were at these four centers, Children's Hospital LA, UC San Francisco, um, Northwestern in Chicago and Boston children, how many kids were totally involved in this? The number they gave us was a joke. So the loss to follow up or the deliberate exclusion for whatever reason had to be extraordinary. Also, it's a $5.7 million study. And I, I, I added up what they reported each you know, center had gotten. Uh, where did the money go? Uh, you know, are, they, are they really saying less than a million dollars? Because that's what it looked like to my eyes. Less than a million dollars was used? 4.7 was left doing nothing? Or are oh. you saying you spent this and awesome. where did the rest go? 
Well, and, yeah. and, and considering what the study is doing, um, if, if, if I'm understanding correctly, they're looking at data that's already been correct, collected. So really it shouldn't cost much to look at data that's already been collected. Um, and so it wouldn't surprise me if they only spent that much, but like you said, where did the rest of the money go? Cause that is a lot of money just to yeah, sort of- It's a five year study. Yeah. Even if you're just sitting around doing admin stuff, expenses mount, you know? There's a lot wrong with the study, you know, before it's even published. And uh, we, are, we are hoping to see a great deal made out of it, both for the institutional independent review boards, um, the people involved in the study, uh, and the NIH itself. And as we've made clear in writing, we don't just think it's a malfeasance thing or error. Um, you know, several of us, you know, since we're involved in this thing, went through the online uh, NIH course on human experimentation. You know, here's what's required, and it's a lot. I don't think any country is more strict than the US when it comes to human experimentation. You add the fact that it's on children, it's stricter yet. And right? it's experimental. I mean, yeah. so we have actually openly questioned if, in fact, we aren't witness to something criminal that happened on the level of the NIH right on down. Yeah, I can't figure out how they got institutional review board approval for this study. I honestly, I have, I, I cannot figure out um, because there's no way it should have been approved. Right. Plus, the letter that you know some of our team members got back themselves from the NIH is further evidence against them. It's really, uh, you know, you, we can't believe you said this in in well, defense of it. And the one thing that I did see, and I don't know if it's been published yet or not, but there was a study that was written by the, uh, the um, private, primary investigators of this, Joanna Ellison Kennedy, Robert Garofalo, and, and a couple of others. And, and it reported that puberty blockers, in fact, do have some negative consequences. And I'm not sure if it's been published yet or not, but um, m what I'm seeing the spin on this as that uh, these activists are saying that because puberty blockers have these side effects, we should just be putting eight-year-olds on the cross-sex hormones and that's the justification. And so it's like, there's always another response. There's, oh, they always have, um, you know, another, a card hidden under the table that they throw out to say, oh, well, well, even though you proved this and this and this, which we said you couldn't, but you ended up doing it, um, we're going to just slant the, the, the argument a little bit and throw something else out there. And that makes it really hard to fight this. Well, yes, I totally understand what you're saying. But insofar as we expect that, we're coming a little experienced in pushing right past it. So what evidence is there you're, you're asking about? How about the Lupron package insert, the primary puberty blocker, which says right on it under adverse you know, reactions, um, worsen depression, you know, worsen this, uh, rare cases they say of increased suicidality and suicide attempts. We have um, Professor Michael Biggs at Oxford, who's I believe a sociologist, who looked at you know, the, the National Health Service there has one gender, they call it GIDS, gender identity, you know, a service kind of thing. It's only at one center there they do it for minors. And at the time, they'd only published one study on their experiment, also, you know, heavily funded, in which they claim the same kind of thing. Oh, you know, see, it, it helps. Well, Michael Biggs went through it and he goes, no, in fact, your published data doesn't show it helped. And when I finally got from you the unpublished data, I found that it made gender dysphoria worse, self-harm worse. Uh, and we have this in other elements of literature. So no, you know, they're, they're driving ideology, which, you know, regrettably is well instilled. But when, you know, the effort, as you well know, uh, the effort against transitioning minors knows no political bounds. You know, this is not a conservative, conservative religious thing. It's conservative and liberal. It's religious and secular. It's, we, we have a team of transgender affirming adults who aren't sorry they did it who are on the team because, you know, as to quote the guy who's their leader, um, well, the male to female transitioner who's their leader, uh, says there is no way a child has the wherewithal, as he said, mentally, physically, and spiritually for the tremendous stress this will be on you to do. There's enough time in adulthood, kids should not be doing this. So 
it's really an all hands on deck, hands across the aisle as one group you know, is named uh, effort to come against this. And we're going to win it. I mean, if you, if you look at it as a David and Goliath thing, don't, that's the path of discouragement. It's like, we're simply not stopping. Uh, don't, you know, don't, well, and, and the other thing is, is we have the science. There's, there's clear science, and the science is mounting yes, uh, it about is. how damaging this is. And so, so I think in the long term, truth does rule out. It's just how many yeah. kids get damaged. Yeah, that's exactly it. it. Um, one of our, um, you know, peeps, uh, Hashi Horvath, recently mm -hmm. retired uh, from the Department of Epidemiology at UC San Francisco, and he had transitioned, you know, the whole shooting match for for twelve years, you know, before some friends finally helped intervene and you know, the lights came on and now he's been working against it, you know, for years. And as he was telling me, as we were waiting to testify against a bill in Sacramento, you know, 15, 20 years, the science of all this is going to be so clear and so laid out and it will be just like the lobotomy movement. Mm -hmm. And everyone will be looking back saying, Oh, how is this possible? How could this, you know, how savage these people were kind of thing. But until then there are lives to be rescued and it's not, you know, they're not being rescued by transition affirming therapy. That's what they need to be rescued from. So that's why we're involved, you know, fairly hot and heavy now. It's damage control. For, we know the end's going to be what it's going to be, and it's going to be good. But we just, you know, the other side, everything is targeting the kids. I mean, it's just all encompassing. It's being driven by pharmaceutical firm. And, you know, I'm not an anti-drug person. I'm a family physician board certified for goodness sakes. But, you know, if you're a pharmaceutical firm that produces the right kind of hormones, you're a biotech firm that's got ideas for how to make a man look more like a woman and vice versa. And you know, you know, anybody who transitions, uh, they are now medicalized for the rest of their life. They will never quit needing the hormones and treatment for whatever uh, complications arrive. Whatever amount of surgery they engaged in has complication rates. Uh, and of course, you know, the probability of further surgery and stuff. So if you can leverage what was initially going to be thousandths of a percent to really be 2%, the money's monumental. Plus, you know, you have these foundations, some of which are just ideological and really want this and others are, I don't know, more money than cents, you know, um, and these large trusts, you know, that are behind it. Jennifer Billick has done a great job you know, writing up about who are the people behind this, where's the money coming from, stuff she's written for the Federalist, you know, some other outlets. Um, and this is what I was trying to explain to a friend from Texas, you know, the other day is like, look, because um, somebody was saying, oh, you can't read Van Maul stuff because it was published and the stories are here and here. And, you know, my fact check thing says that's radical right. Well, radical right simply means it wasn't left. You know, there's you never hear about a radical left from these people and you never hear right of center. It's either radical right or it's our side. Well, and since when is good science radical right? I mean, that's yeah. ironic, isn't it? <laughs> science doesn't have a political party if it's yeah. done right, you know, right. unless you've already, you know, made ideology to be your filter for the science. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's all sides involved on this. Having said that, you've got people like Jennifer Billick, a, a former lefty, um, other people who remain proudly lefty. Uh, radical feminists who work together with us, uh, GLBT groups who work together with us on this, who tell us the only place they can be published is the conservative literature, like the Federalist, like uh, Christian uh, Post. Republic, is it? That's the wrong name. Uh, Christian NLO. Post. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, yeah, Christian Post, for example. I'm sorry, I'm suddenly stammering for your crew here. Uh, the other one I'm looking for is public discourse. It's, it's lefties publishing in there, and they're the first to tell us that uh, the left will not publish them. They're blocked. So, yeah, you know, except for what succeeds in getting in the peer review literature or, or the rare, um, you know, article and maybe something like The Atlantic uh, that tends toward the left but allows some other stuff in there. Um, their side just really wouldn't be hearing about it through their normal sources. Well, I'm so grateful that you and your team are on this. And, and before we go, is there anything else that you wanted to share? Well, yeah, there's all kinds of resources, you know, that your, your folks should look up. Um, there's the American College of Pediatricians, uh, acpeds.org, so acpeds.org. 
Um, and when you log on, just you know, use their little search engine to go to the gender identity transgenderism thing. Lots of resources, parent support group, how to find the right kind of counselor, that's important. Um, there's this thing called the Parents Resource Guide, uh, which had a little you know, bit to do with helping to edit at genderresourceguide.com, one word. It's a free download. It's information for parents and students on what they need to know about the issue, their rights in school, how to interact with, with uh, teachers, principals, even school board sample letters. It's, it's an all-in-one, well worth it. Uh, things that I've written, uh, you'd go to cmda.org, uh, Christian Medical and Dental Association, just look up my name and boom, tons of stuff there. Uh, public discourse, public or the public discourse.com and uh, my most recent article was just published uh, this week there um, there if you can find it on social media uh, his name is money it's on Facebook and others and uh, one of the, the guys in our extended group is a film producer and he's been doing these little five-minute interviews with people who who have regret um, and made a documentary out of it but since everything's five minutes long you know, it can be cut up and distributed social media here and there on the web. If it's taken down in one place, it pops up in another. And since it's made of five minute bits, it, they never quit adding to it. Uh, great stories and stuff there. And just between that, you know, I think there's a lot of information for people to get caught up quick. Another organization that has started is a, a SEGM, the Society for Evidence-Based Gender Medicine. And I guess we think of them as an alternative to WPATH. And it's only professionals, you know, doctors, psychologists, and whatnot. Um, and they're kind of doing the, the same thing we are in terms of going after this stuff. In fact, at this point, um, between, you know, like some of the different groups I work with, some of the different groups out there, I think we've demonstrated with this AJP article that we could be at the point where whenever one of these big touted junk studies shows up, that um, we can take it down, so to speak, by which I mean, you have multiple letters showing the flaws in the thing. That From all very well-respected professionals. I mean, yeah, and that all shows up, you know, kind of at one time with the journals. It becomes very hard for them to disallow, to not publish, because many of us have access to other things we can write it about. Yeah, you know, we write about it and get the information out there. So, hopeful this will be part of getting the tide turned. Yes. Well, and thank you so much for your work. Uh, let the rest of your team members know that we are incredibly thankful for their commitment to this because it is, it's such an important issue. I just, every time I think about, you know, what's happening to these kids, it just breaks my heart. And, mm -hmm. and it does give me hope to know that there are people like you out there fighting, fighting for our kids. So thank you so much. And you, Erin, we thank you for what you're doing. Thank Thanks. you very much.